Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we begin a new series on agriculture. It's going to be a short one, only about three videos. Our first topic for the day is going to be the Green Revolution. So as always, let me get you some objectives, and we'll jump in. By the end of this video, we'll be able to talk about changes in the global diet over the last 10 years and discuss the major components of the Green Revolution. Now, before we start talking about agriculture, you need to understand a major shift that happened about 10,000 years ago. Uh, about 10,000 years ago, for the first time, people learned how to start cultivating crops and domesticating animals for our own use. Up until this point in human history, we had been hunters and gatherers, so we were very dependent on whatever we could find or kill to meet our nutritional needs. And up until this point in history, you would have people starving as a fairly frequent part of life because food was unavailable. 10,000 years ago when the agricultural revolution began, we learned how to raise crops and raise animals for our own purposes. Thus making the growth of the human population, uh, I guess, possible because for the first time in human history, there was enough food available to go around and there was actually even extra food available. So no longer did you have people starving to death, rather you had a food supply that could actually support a growing revolution. So in your head, tag 10,000 years ago, agricultural revolution made food available for lots of people. Now we need to talk about nutritional requirements and what the human body actually needs. Um, baseline, now obviously this is going to vary by person and population and activity level and gender and all that stuff, but the baseline is roughly 2200 calories are needed every day for a person to sustain a healthy lifestyle. Um, there are three grades of nutrition you need to, need to know about. You need to know about undernourishment. Undernourishment is the situation where a person is not getting enough calories to meet their daily needs and it's been shown that a daily food deficit of one to 400 calories a day can lead to severe developmental delays. Um, a reduction in IQ can lead to a lack of energy, um, greater incidence of illness. So undernourishment, even if it is only 100 calories a day, can be a big problem. Malnourishment is different from undernourishment. Malnourishment is a condition in which a diet does not have the proper amount of nutrition in it. So a person may be getting enough calories, but they may not be getting all of the proteins or vitamins or minerals that they need to meet their daily needs. And then there is overnourishment, which is a problem we are seeing increasingly in the developed world over the last 20 or 30 years. And this is a condition where a person is getting too many calories in a day, leading to weight gain and obesity and all the problems that go along with that that we have talked about previously. So know that a person can be malnourished and still be overnourished. So a person could get too many calories, but they could not have the proper vitamins and minerals in those calories. So they are both overnourished and malnourished. A person can also be undernourished and malnourished need to talk about this idea of food security. Now, food security is basically a situation in which people have got access to food on a daily basis. They have the resources they need to buy the food that they require. They can actually get to that food and the food is available to them. So if a person has all of those things, they have food security. Now, a huge proportion of the world's population has food insecurity. This is a situation where, for whatever reason, they do not have access to an adequate supply of food. And there's a couple reasons for this. Um, one of the major ones would be famine. Now, famine would be a condition where there just is not food available. It might be the result of drought, or it might be the result of some other contributing factor. Globally, we know that there is enough food produced on a yearly basis to meet everybody's nutri nutritional needs around the world, and yet somehow, for some reason, almost 9 million people a year starve to death. And this is because of unequal distribution of food supplies. Now, developed world, we've got plenty of food, and it's available to us, and it's easy to get, but in the developing world, that food is not available. So though we could spread it out and say there's enough food in the world for everybody, there's a large proportion of the population that doesn't have access to that food. Politics could be another problem that could lead to food insecurity, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, along with food insecurity, you need to know about a couple of vitamin deficiencies. Uh, vitamin A deficiency is a big problem. If a person does not have enough vitamin A in their, in their diet, it can lead to blindness, and then there's anemia where a person does not get enough iron in their diet, leading to a condition where their red blood cells are not as abundant or are not able to carry oxygen as well. Now, if we're going to talk about the things that make up the human diet presently, corn, rice, and wheat comprise 60% of human energy intake in that order. So around the world, most of the world's calories come from corn. 
then rice, then wheat. You need to know those three off the top of your head. Um, these are also known as cereal crops, C-E-R-E-A-L, like the cereal you eat every morning. So know that grains are also known as cereal crops and that they are the biggest proportion of the human diet. And we got to talk about meat while we're talking about food as well. You got that cute guy looking at you. You need to recognize that with affluence comes a carnivorous diet. So people who are poor living in the developing world aren't going to have the money that is required to raise and butcher and process meat. And so they're not likely to have much meat in their diet. It, the, generally in the developing world, your diet is going to consist mostly of grains and things that you can grow. As a country becomes more affluent, its consumption of meat increases dramatically as the resources become available to raise and process that meat. So as a country becomes more affluent, their meat intake uh, rises and thus rises their environmental impact and I'll talk about that in just a second. Final question I want to address before we jump into some other things is why is there malnutrition in the first place? Like I mentioned previously, around the world there's plenty of food produced to feed everybody if it were distributed evenly. Now some major reasons why malnutrition still exists. The big one is poverty. People who don't have the resources can't buy food and can't grow food. So poverty would be one of the big drivers of malnutrition. There's also politics. Um, in a lot of countries, governments are corrupt and they do not distribute resources properly. So if you live in a country that has got a poor or a difficult political situation, it's possible that as a result of the politics in your country or wars your country might be fighting, you may not have access to food. Um, livestock is another reason, which sounds kind of weird, but 40% of the world's grain crops are actually fed to cattle in order to raise them. So if you've got a large proportion of the grain that's being grown being fed to cattle, then obviously those calories can't go to people. And then worldwide grain production per person has leveled off since 1980. So crop production has gone up, but for some reason that is as of yet unexplained, the amount of grain available per person has evened out. So the world population is growing, but the grain production numbers are not increasing along with it. So all of this talk of malnutrition, poor nutrition, food insecurity, leads us to the Green Revolution. In the 1930s and 40s, there was a gentleman by the name of Norman Borlaug, and he was very interested in how we might be able to increase the global production of food such that it will meet the needs of the world population. And the major things that he worked on were selective breeding, really intensive selective breeding. He uh, developed um, strains of wheat and rice that were drought tolerant and resistant to pests and able to be grown in areas that formerly would not have supported crops. Um, he also pioneered the idea of industrial agriculture. And I'll talk about the components of that in, in a minute. but. Uh, Norman Borlaug ended up winning the Nobel Peace Prize for increasing global food production to such a large scale. Um, it is believed that the world population would not be what it is today without his work in the Green Revolution because that extra food has been able to support a larger human population. And in order to understand the Green Revolution, you need to understand the idea of agricultural energy subsidy. Lots of words. All it means is the amount of energy that is needed to produce a calorie of food. And when we talk about the energy needed to produce a calorie of food, we are talking about the energy needed to raise a crop or cattle or livestock. We're talking about the processing and we're talking about the transporting. Now, I got a little, um, I guess, chart there on the side for you and you go all the way down to the bottom. Hunting and gathering has very little energy subsidy. The only energy that is put into the production of that food is whatever energy the person burns looking for that food or hunting. Going up the chart a little bit, You've got small scale corn production. So this is just going to be, you know, on a home farm or something like this. In hunting and gathering and small scale corn production, you get out more calories than you put in. So hunting and gathering, you spend 0.1 calories for every calorie of food you get. Small scale corn production, you spend 0.2 calories for every calorie of food that you get. Large scale corn farming has an energy subsidy of 0.5. Small scale egg production is just above that. Coastal fishing is kind of the break-even point. Coastal fishing is a point where you are putting in one calorie of energy and getting out one calorie of food. And then above that, things start to change. You can see that large-scale egg production is above two calories put in for every one calorie you get out. Grass-fed beef is probably about four calories put in for every calorie you get out. The typical U.S. diet in the 1950s had an energy subsidy of five. 
Typical U.S. diet in 2010 has got a energy subsidy of 10, so this means that 10 calories of energy are used for every one calorie um, of food that's produced. Feedlot beef production, this was going back to the idea of environmental impact of eating meat, has a energy subsidy somewhere around 12. And then far offshore fishing has got the biggest energy subsidy around 20. So be aware of the idea that it takes energy to produce food. And to wrap up today with the major components of the Green Revolution. So I talked about Norman Borlaug starting the Green Revolution. There were some major components of the Green Revolution. I'm going to go through each one. The first one was mechanization. So his work pioneered the idea of using machines to produce food rather than human labor. Machines are great because they're efficient. Um, and if you've got a big, big enough farm, they are cost effective. So obviously buying a tractor up front is very expensive. However, if you've got enough land, you are going to be able to farm that land more efficiently and it's eventually going to pay off in the end to have you own that tractor. However, if you are on a small farm, you are not going to be able to own a tractor probably because your farm is going to be big enough to produce enough money for you to pay for your tractor. So mechanization favors large farm production rather than small farm production, but it does significantly increase the efficiency of farming work. The next quality you need to know about is irrigation. Now humans have carried out irrigation for a really long time, but with the Green Revolution we see irrigation becoming much more efficient. And we've previously talked about different types of irrigation, so I'm not going to go over them again. But you do need to know that some of the major consequences of irrigation are obviously groundwater loss. We talked about drawing down the Ugalala Aquifer previously. You can get waterlogging, which is a situation where the too much water is in the soil and plants aren't able to exchange gases, so essentially the plants may drown in the soil. You can also get salinization, which is a situation where water has got some salt in it. As that water is irrigated over the field and then evaporates, it leaves the salt behind. Um, that salt builds up in the soil, and soil that has become too salty is no longer good for growing plants. So those would be major consequences of irrigation that you need to know about. Next major component of the Green Revolution was fertilizers, and this was probably the biggest contributor to the enormous increase in global food production. Um, intensive farming obviously draws a lot of nutrition out of the soil without replacing it. And if nutrients are pulled out of the soil, then you're not able to grow crops there. So Throughout history, farmers have used organic fertilizers, usually in the form of animal waste, and that does replace nutrition and organic um, material in the soil, but it is not as targeted or as effective as synthetic fertilizers, which are fertilizers that humans have prepared. Um, the two nutrients that plants need the most and that most often limit plant growth are nitrogen and phosphorus. So synthetic fertilizers are usually produced containing a high degree of nitrogen and phosphorus, thus targeting exactly what the plants need. Now, some consequences of fertilizer use. Obviously, the benefit is a huge increase in crop production. Some of the drawbacks is it takes a tremendous amount of fossil fuels to produce uh, especially nitrogen containing fertilizers. Um, essentially to produce a nitrogen fertilizer, natural gas is burned, that fixes the nitrogen in the atmosphere, and then from those materials, uh, nitrogenous fertilizers can be made. So uses a lot of fossil fuels. Synthetic fertilizers can run off the land very easily and into waterways, causing algal blooms and eutrophication, which we've talked about previously. And synthetic fertilizers don't actually add anything to the soil. So they throw in the nutrients that the plants need, the plants suck those nutrients up and you're kind of at a zero-sum game where nothing extra is added to that soil. So those would be fertilizers. You got monocropping and then there's one more beyond this. Monocropping is growing a single crop on a plot of land. Uh, historically until the Green Revolution, farmers would grow multiple crops on their land so that they had whatever they needed for food and trade and to take care of their family. But Growing one crop is much more efficient because you can get all the machinery specialized to that crop. You can deal with just that crop and things become easier. Problem is, there are some problems that go along with monocropping, um, including erosion. Um, if you are monocropping, this means that you are planting and harvesting all of your land at one time, which means that your whole plot of land could have no vegetation on it for a significant amount of time, which makes it open to wind and water erosion. Also, Pests are a big threat to monocrops because all you need is one type of bug to get in there and it can take out your whole crop. If you are growing a diverse number of crops, then 
one pest might take out one type of thing that you're growing, but you will still have other foods available to you. So monocropping is specifically, uh, I guess, harmed by pests, which leads us to our last feature of the Green Revolution, which was use of pesticides. There are insecticides for insects, herbicides to kill weeds, and then rodenticides for rodents and vermin. Uh, you've got broad spectrum pesticides and selective pesticides. A broad spectrum pesticide is designed to kill any pest that it comes in contact with. A selective pesticide kills specific bugs. Um, obviously, it is most efficient to spray a broad spectrum pesticide because you kill everything in one shot. Problem is, doing so kills off a lot of beneficial insects. There are a lot of insects in the natural world that eat pest insects without harming plants. Ladybugs are a great example. They eat aphids, which... Uh, aphids are pests that harm plants. The ladybugs don't harm the plants, they just eat the aphids, so they're great to have around. But if you're spraying a broad-spectrum pesticide, you're going to kill off the ladybugs too. Obviously, you've got increased efficiency. If you don't have pests eating your crops, you don't need to plant as much land to get the same amount of food. So by using pesticides, you can increase the, far the efficiency of your farming operation. Now, a couple problems that go along with pesticides is persistence. Um, you need to know the acronym POP, P-O-P, Persistent Organic Pesticide. This is going to be a pesticide that sticks around in the environment for a really long time. In a previous video, we talked about DDT, highly effective pesticide that was banned because it was shown to be harmful to wildlife through the process of bioaccumulation where more DDT accumulates in the uh, tissue of an organism as you move up the food chain. You can also get resistance in the pesticide treadmill. So resistance is the idea that if you spray a field with a pesticide, just naturally by virtue of genetic mutation, there are going to be some pests that are resistant to that pesticide. So the pesticide is going to kill off everything except for your pests that are resistant. The ones that are resistant are going to be the ones that will reproduce, and suddenly you have got a population of pests that are resistant to your pesticide which leads to the pesticide treadmill, which is the idea that, all right, these pests are resistant, so we need to develop a new pesticide to kill them off. So develop a new pesticide, you spray it, it kills off everything except for the pesticide that is resistant to that one. So now you've got a pest that is resistant to two pesticides. And the cycle continues and continues and continues, and all the while you are developing new pesticides, which are probably killing more bugs, and at the same time, you're helping to selectively breed a generation of pests that are resistant to a ton of different pesticides. And the last problem with pesticides is they're often toxic. They were meant to kill things. So yeah, great, they kill the bugs. They get into the water supply, um, the farm workers that are spraying them, you get it on your apples. All of these can harm the health of human populations because like I said, pesticides were meant to kill things. So ingesting them is not so good for the body. And I think that's it. I'm guessing that this was probably a pretty long video. My apologies, but make sure that you're aware of just kind of some basic ideas around food, global food supply, as well as the features of the Green Revolution. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I hope to see you again.